Good morning. Good morning. Of course, I'm hands-free today. <laughs> I know. Without. <laughs> don't. Don't do that. Don't touch things back there. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. No. I may, uh, <clears throat> I may turn many shades of red if that happens. And not uh, because I'm blushing. All right, why don't we stand and turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. I have a few verses there I want to read this morning. Colossians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament. Under C. Just saying. It's true. Yeah. Right? Colossians 3. I'm going to be reading from the New King James this morning. My old Bible. I still haven't broken in the new Bible. I don't know. I think the new one might be for my personal use, and I think I might keep this one for the sermons. I'm not sure. Anyway, Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Father God, we just come to you this morning. I thank you and I praise you that we can come, that we can worship together. Lord, I thank you for this, uh, the word that you've given, and I ask that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. There's a, there's a crisis that's happening in Christianity and in uh, America. Probably not in the world as much. I mean, although there is some place. Definitely happening in Christianity in the churches and happening uh, in America in people's lives. And that crisis is an identity crisis. And what I mean by that is people are struggling to find out who they are, to discover who they are, to live as who they are. I mean, we have all of these things that are happening, all of these questions and all of these things, people, I mean, the, the very basic things are being questioned. And people can't even figure out those things. So we have this identity crisis where uh, we, we form all kinds of different identities uh, we have different personas depending on where we are, right? Have you noticed that? We have the, you know, the, the home version of ourselves. Like we've become almost like uh, Microsoft Office that we have, you know, the home version, the student version, the business version, right? All of these different versions of who we are. The problem that happens is when we when we live like that, when we have all these different personas or different identities um, or versions of ourself, depending on the situation we're in, it seems like it's not that big of a deal. It seems like it's fine, right? Oh, you know, it's just a version of who I am. But the problem is that's often not who we actually are. We don't live as who we are. We don't live as who Christ says we are. And these lines get blurred until we really become split personality. Right? We have like multiple personality disorder going on in our life. And it's not a diagnosis. It's just simply what happens when we try to be all of these different people instead of being who we actually are. And we lose out on who we really are. There's a, a clip I want to show you. How many of you ever watched the show Seinfeld? Okay, good. If you haven't ever watched Seinfeld, you're going to watch just a, a minute-long clip here. Uh, and and it's, it's really good. There, uh, Jerry Seinfeld is the, the lead of this sitcom, and, and he has a good friend, George Costanza. Uh, and what we're going to see in this uh, clip uh, that's going to be shown is that George is having a little bit of a crisis in life. He often had a lot of crises, but uh, this is a crisis that has struck him over this very identity question that we've been talking about, right? So 
We, do we have that clip ready? Okay, uh, let's watch this clip uh, that deals with that whole issue of uh, identity. Can we turn these lights off? You have no idea of the magnitude of this thing. If she is allowed to infiltrate this world, then George Costanza, as you know him, ceases to exist. <laughs> you see, right now, I have relationship George, but there is also independent George. That's the George you know, the George you grew up with. Movie George, coffee shop George, liar George, bawdy George. I, I love that George. Me too, and he's dying, Jerry. <laughs> If relationship George walks through this door, he will kill independent George. A George divided against itself cannot stand. You're killing independent George. You know that, don't you? George, I don't even want to get... You know what Susan News last night? Huh? Vault! <laughs> so? She got that from you. Well, I didn't tell her to say it. What, she's the only girl in the whole world? Why can't you find your own girl? I like her. You see? You see? You see what I'm talking about? It's all just slipping away. And you're letting it happen. So George is having a uh, crisis in his life. All because of is these two identities are, are going to have to occupy the same space. That's dangerous in his world. That's dangerous in our world when there are different people, different mics, for instance. When, they're, when we're different, when we're all these different people, we're trying to balance these things. It's like those time travel movies where you, they always warn you, don't ever occupy the same space as yourself in the past or the present, you know, the future or whatever your traveling is. Because when it happens, catastrophic things happen. And George is talking about that. He's talking about these worlds colliding and how one of them is going to die if relationship George walks through the door and occupies the same space as independent George. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about how many of us have all of these different us's out there. And we, we risk real problems when we start to isolate them to different areas. And we don't want people to see these things. And we begin to worry about what if those people meet this me when I'm not in that situation but I'm over in this situation, what will they think? What will the people who are there think of them being there? And we, like, seriously, it, it, it makes our eyes go crazy and our minds just explode because we don't want people to get to know these other versions of ourselves. So there's this identity crisis. And as I said, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. Like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm different when I'm at work and I'm different when I'm at home and I'm different when I'm at, you know, because it's just the situations, you know, those things, it requires it. But the question I have for you is, is does it really require it? Or are we putting it up as a, a defensive mechanism so that people don't get to know the real us? Are we doing it uh, so that we can do things or say things or, uh, that we would never do in these other situations? You know, it's like there's friend Mike, and when friend Mike is hanging out with friends, he'll say and do all of these things, but friend Mike would never show up to church, Mike. That, they just don't, they're not the same person. They would be, oh my goodness, what would they think? Right? Or, or, or what if, you know, church Mike goes home and acts at home like he does at church, or vice versa, right? There's this issue, what, what, you know, so often we're one person in one place and one person in another place, you know, at church we're like, oh yes, things are wonderful, hallelujah, thank you Lord, right? And it's like, oh, you know, we walk into the rooms and the harp play, we go home, and all of a sudden it's not the harp, it's like the drums, you know, or the, the three uh, things on the piano that makes like the jaw sound. 
You know, like what happens when that happens? Well, what do other people think when we show up? Do they ever wonder, the people who are close to us, do they ever wonder which version of you they're going to have to deal with? You see, this happens when we have this, this split personality. And, it, and it's crazy because what happens is we, we begin to lose our true identity and we become all of these other fictitious versions of ourselves and we lose who we truly are at our core. And when we forget who we really are, we stop living the life that God has for us and we start becoming like secret agent man, right? Where we're getting ready in the morning or a situation comes and we pull out our little, you know, safety deposit box that we have hidden in the floorboards and it has all of these passports with different, it's same picture, just different people, right? And we're like, okay, who am I going to be? Which country am I going to be from? You know, and we grab the, uh, the, the stash of uh, passports and we grab the, uh, the money for the currency of where we're going to be going and, you know, and then we go. And then the theme music starts playing and we're like, you know, really what's going on around us, right? We don't trust anybody. That happens when we're trying to be something that we're not. When, we, when this happens, we tend to treat other people differently than we treat ourselves. Maybe we don't extend as much grace to them or forgiveness to them as we do to ourselves. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe we don't extend ourselves the kind of forgiveness and grace that we extend to other people. Right? We're like, oh, well, they deserve it. I don't. Or I deserve it, and they don't. You see what happens when you lose your identity? When you start to play things that way, not only do you look at yourself differently, you look at other people differently, and they can't possibly do it. Here's another thing. What happens when we don't give other people the same gospel that we give ourselves? Or again, vice versa. We don't give ourselves the same gospel. Maybe we preach a gospel of love and mercy and forgiveness. And that God, you know, has washed away all of our sins to other people. But when it comes to us, maybe we don't. Maybe we're harder on ourselves than we are on other people. Or maybe we're a lot harder on other people than we are ourselves. Right? There's just no consistency when we live our life that way. That's one of the dangers that comes in, in having these different personas. Right? It is, uh, I mean, and this is truly like one of, in, in law enforcement and things like that, and uh, even in uh, the spy game, like there's concern for people who have, who spend too much time undercover or uh, as a, you know, secret agent or something. There's a concern that they're going to lose their true identity. That they're going to then take on that persona and that's who they're going to be even if it's different than who they really are. Because they get lost in it. We get lost in those things. And I don't want us to be lost in who, are, who we are. I don't want us to have these different personalities and different personas and different, you know, uh, disguises that we wear everywhere. And that we, we have that issue unless we're all just being honest and truthful to who we are, right? When we're honest and truthful, when we are who the Bible says we are, and we all live that way, there's no danger in, you know, uh, relationship George coming near, you know, independent George. There's no issue with that because you're the same, right? You don't have to worry about what will people think of me in this situation? Well, it's going to not matter because you're going to be the same in every situation. It's not going to matter if you, if your friends come with you and you hang out with your church people and your home life and business and all of those things because you're going to be the same person. It's only when we're trying to hide that, that we have problems. So this morning, I want to just go through quickly for you a reminder of who God says that you are, right? This needs to be your primary identity because this is truly who you are. I don't care how many, how many years you've been being somebody else. Maybe you've done it to try and uh, please yourself. Maybe you've done it to try and please other people. Maybe you've tried to do it to please the boss or to, uh, or to please society. But that's not who you are. 
It's just who you've been pretending to be. So I want to share with you this morning some truths from God's Word as to remind you who you are and then give you the scriptural backing, the references to those things. First, you need to understand that you are beloved. You are beloved. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. That is God's word to you. He's saying, you are beloved. I have drawn you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. So you don't have to pretend to perform and, and be, you know, Christian Mike around God. Because God knows who we really are. And it doesn't matter which persona we put on. God says, I love you. I love you just the way you are. I've loved you with an everlasting love. So we're beloved in that. And that should be settling. That should be calming in our life is to know that we're loved. We're not loved by, we don't have to be loved by other people. We're loved by God, the one who created us, right? The the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who holds all of existence in uh, in his hand, who, who, who created everything and says, you are beloved. With an everlasting love. Everlasting, always lasting. In other words, it can't be taken away. And because we're loved that way, we can also understand that we are a child of God. We're a child of God. Think about that. Like, think about who your parents are, right? No, I'm not thinking, I mean, God gives us worldly parents, you know, parents that, who brought us into this world and thank God for them and God even has a provision for that. We're supposed to honor them, right? We're supposed to honor our father and mother. But I'm talking about we are a child of God. First John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Think about that. See the love of the Father on us, right? That he, he, that he has bestowed upon us, right? That he's lavished on us, that we should be called a child of God because that's what we are. If you are nothing else, but you are a child of God who is beloved. It doesn't matter what other people think. I mean, just if we got that, we are delighted in Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Now, you know, there's a time in our life when, uh, when, we're, we're, when we're young, right? And maybe today, but most happens when we're, when we're little and we're insecure and things... Right? And there's this amazing thing that happens when um, one of our parents holds us close and just sings. Right? It's, just, it's comforting. There's a reason why we sing to infants. There's a reason why they respond to it. It's because we respond to that because we see the love through that. Right? We understand how, how much we're loved, how much we're delighted in, in those times. And that's what God wants to do in our life. He says, I, want, I delight in you. I take great delight in you. Again, have you noticed that none of these things have anything to do with how you act? They have nothing to do with how you respond or what you do or don't do. These are just facts that God says, this is, this is what I think about you, and this is the truth. You are delighted in. Here's another one. I love this one. You are forgiven. Whew, right? You are forgiven. Think about that. Forgiven. Right? 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. So that, 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 understand that that applies to us, but it also applies to others. So when we look at other people and we won't forgive them, then no, no, they're forgiven like we're forgiven. But I suspect a lot of us here do the reverse where we extend to others God's forgiveness. But then we're just so much harder on ourselves. 
We, hear, we, we tell ourselves things like, well, I'm a Christian, I should know better. I go to church, I should know better. I'm a pastor, I should know better. And we treat ourselves unfairly. We treat ourselves different than God treats us. And we treat ourselves different than we treat other people. So the question is, who are we? Who are they? Right? When you look in the mirror, who do you see? If you look in the mirror and you see, you know, contempt and you see uh, guilt and you see all these things, that is not who God says you are. You are not seeing the true you when you look in the mirror that way. You are seeing something other than who God says you are. You are seeing a false identity when God says those are not your things. You are forgiven. You are a child of mine. You are delighted in. You are beloved. You're forgiven. And because we're forgiven, the next thing that we need to understand is that we are washed clean. Isaiah 1.18 says, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. That's God's word. That's the truth. You can come and we come and we all do. We come with these filthy garments and, and we come and we're just dirty. And, and we're just covered in the blood of sin. And God says, no, no, no. I'm going to wash you with the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. And that blood is going to make you pure and white like wool, like the driven snow, it's going to be, you're going to be clean. You're going to have new garments on you because you're going to be washed clean in it. And it doesn't matter what other people think. People are like, oh, you stink. No, I don't. I put on Jesus this morning. You understand what I'm saying? Right? I've been washed in the blood. I don't need acts. I need Jesus in my life. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter what other people think. So we're washed clean and we're we're forgiven and we're delighted in and we are free. Man, just think about that, free. We don't always completely understand that. I mean, we live in a free country and I put air quotes around it because I have this argument with Mila a lot and other people like, we're free. We need more laws to make us more free. It's like, that's not how it works. But anyway, that's not how God works. God says you are free, right? Galatians 5.1 says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. God says you are free, period. Not you are free when you do all the right things. No, you're free. God says you have been set free. We had a time when there was the law. But Jesus came and he fulfilled the law so that we could be free. So that we don't have to go around and do all these different things and get to check in the box. Okay, is this a clean animal? Okay, I'm going to put that over there. And I got to, where, where's the wood? Where's the wood for the burnt offering? What did you do with it? Jesus gave his life, died on the cross, paid the ransom, the price for our sins, bought us out of slavery with his blood so that we are free. And if we are free, if the Son has set us free, then we are free indeed. We're free. We should live in free. And it even tells us here, don't go back and live in bondage. Only you can put yourself back into bondage. So don't do it. That's what the Word of God is telling us. It's an amazing thing. It also happens to be what our nation was founded upon. The freedom of God. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. How cool is that? Now, I want, I want to... Before I read this verse, I want us to understand that. Because I suspect many of us have heard that before. But it's never, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit is, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? And it always follows something that you've done that they don't like. Right? You got a tattoo. Did you know you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. I was just decorating. No, 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 no. How could you do that? You cut your hair. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. What? I'm bald. What is that saying? God, that I'm not a temple of the Holy Spirit? What? Like I have a dome? What? Some of you have like, you know, nice, good, you know, roofing on. I, don't, I mean, it's just crazy the things that we get into. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, dwells inside of you. Right? It's a, I don't care what's on the outside. 
God says, I look at what's on the inside. Stop getting, we get so caught up in this, what does the outside look like? The outside looks like a body. And a body that's not perfect. A body that has issues. Thank the Lord that we're not going to be stuck in these bodies forever. So 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 is the uh, uh, verse for that. It says, do you not know that your, body, that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So here's the thing. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, right? When we get saved, that's the Christian terminology. We're born again, whatever terminology you want to use. When that happens, it is a fact that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. We therefore are now a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. That's a fact. Right? That's just the truth. So, that's a fact. It doesn't say, who comes to live inside of you, only if you don't do blah, 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 blah. If you eat white flour, then you are not a temple of the Holy Spirit because you're destroying yourself. No. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It's a fact. Right? These are all factual things about us. How can we be children of God if we're not adopted into God's family? Romans 8, 15 says, The spirit you received brought, you, uh, brought about your adoption into sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Right? We are adopted in God's family. You know what I love about this? Is this principle of it. I know for me sometimes, when my parents would tell me that they loved me, usually after I did something wrong, my parents say, hey, we love you. And I would think to myself, well, you have to. You're my parents. You know, God loves us. He adopted us. He chose us. Do you understand that? Like, he didn't have to, but he does. You've been adopted by God. Because he looked and said, you know what? I love you, and I want you to be part of my family forever. How cool is that? Right? We're adopted. Right? I mean, I, my little sister, I convinced her for almost a month when she was little that she was adopted. <laughs> that was before I understood that it was theologically correct. I was just doing it to make her feel bad. But now I'm trying to do it to make you feel good about yourself. To understand that that's who you are. You were adopted by God. And I'm not even going to get in trouble for that. See, mom, dad, I can tell people they're adopted and not get grounded. I still think she had questions just a little. I like that. It's still kind of fun. But anyway. Because we're adopted, because we're God's children, because of all of these things, because we've been adopted, we are co-heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17 says, now if we are children, and that means we are, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So all of the things that God gives to his children, gives to his son Jesus, we're co-heirs with. In other words, we get it too. How awesome is that? You want to talk about awesome? It's like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm an heir to a king. That's awesome. Come on, you can't, how can you not be excited about that, right? You're talking about identities. Who do you want to be? You're a king. You're a queen. Come on. You're like a prince. Like, come on. Just live that way. Right? People are like, oh, isn't she acting like a princess? Yes, because I am. <laughs> Do you not know who my dad is? He is the king. My brother is the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Right? He's not the Lord of Dutch or Duke of whatever. He is the king of kings, the Lord of Lords. That's who I'm joint heirs with. Get excited about that. This next one for those who grew up in the 80s might be confusing until I explain it. You are righteous, man. No. <laughs> you are a righteous man or woman. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, for he, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteousness. The righteousness of God in him. We are righteous means made right. Some of you already think you're right all the time. Right? 
Husbands are like, yeah. <clears throat> Do you hear that, honey? He's, he knows too. Just kidding. <laughs> We are made righteous because of what Jesus did for us. We have been taken from the wrong place and put into the right setting. We are in the right place at the right time and the right thing because of who Christ is. It's awesome. And because of that, we're new. We're new. I mean, come on. I know sometimes you get up in the morning. Or I shouldn't say you. I get up in the morning and it's like, you know, Rice Krispies commercial happening. Step out of bed, you're like, mm, snap, crack, pop. Right? I go to my trainer, you know, a couple times a week and like the exercises, she's like, all right, do a lunge. And I do a lunge and she's like, did that snapping or popping hurt? No. It just does that. Right? I mean, seriously, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's just insane. But we're new. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's your identity. You're new. You're new. When people start bringing up the old you, I'm sorry, that's an old version. You don't have the updated version because I'm new. I'm a new creation in Christ. So I would just prefer if you just address me that way. But what about your past? You mean the past has already been taken care of? Yeah, you're dwelling too much in the past. I'm dwelling in the future, right? Stop worrying about the things that are behind. Stop worrying about the things that are ahead. The only good that comes out of behind is when we look back and we see the landmarks when God was faithful. All of our problems, issues, those are gone. We look back, we see God was faithful, so now we can look ahead and take on what's coming because we know God is faithful, because we're new. Here's a good one. You are a saint. Yeah, that's right. Kids, tell your parents that. Pastor Mike says, I'm a saint. <laughs> yes. And that's when the parents be like, well, I'm the parent. Right? I am your father. No, that's a different. <laughs> You're a saint. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You are a saint. You don't even have to perform three miracles. The Catholic Church doesn't even have to t like, do any sort of voting. You are a saint because the Bible says so because God made it that way. You're just a saint. You're a saint because you're set apart. You're different, right? You are, 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You are set apart. The Bible says you are peculiar, which means weird. Be weird. Right? We just talked about it at the co-op on Friday when we did chapel. We talked about how the Bible tells us that we are salt and we are light. That's what Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. There wasn't a question. You are. Right? And we did a little taste test. Yeah. <laughs> Noah did a little taste test. <laughs> to see if we could recognize salt when it's present. Even when it looks like Kool-Aid. It's not if it's made with salt. It's still Kool-Aid. It just doesn't taste as good. I mean, I don't think. I didn't taste it. I wasn't that foolish. But Noah did. Right? And we just did a test to see, you know, right? It looks like Kool-Aid. It shakes like Kool-Aid. I mean, you're looking at it, it's the same, same color. It doesn't taste the same because salt is unique. When I asked Noah his expert opinion, having tried salt, what salt tastes like, you know what he said it tastes like? Salt. You know why? Because salt tastes like salt. It's unique. So be salt. Taste different. Be peculiar. You are. You're set apart. You are an ambassador of Christ. This is really cool. I, I love this one. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We're ambassadors. And we go in the name of the Lord, which is awesome and can be scary. Right? It can be scary because what are we showing? Who are we showing Christ to be who we come in the name of? Right? If we're coming and we're just beating people down and we're not giving them grace and we're not giving them compassion and we're not teaching them the gospel, then we are making Christ out to be something that he's not. But it's also awesome because there are privileges that go with being an ambassador. And you know what one of those great privileges is? You can't be prosecuted for the things you do in the foreign land. Right? So we're not being prosecuted for that. You know why we're not being prosecuted for it? Because Jesus already paid for it. 
So the devil could come and say, here's a list of all of the things that you did wrong while you were in that foreign land. Because this earth is a foreign land to us. We don't belong here. We are passing through. We are ambassadors here. We're pilgrims. Our um, home is in heaven, right? So when, the, when the Satan comes and he has all of these things and says, here's all the things you've done wrong. You just say, forgiven. Move along. I have diplomatic immunity because I come in the name of the one who has set me free. It's awesome. We're co-laborers in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are, uh, you are God's field, God's building. So we're co-laborers. We're working with God. We're either working with God or we're working against God. You don't want to be on that other side. Here's, the, oh, here's a good one. You're never alone. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You are never alone. Satan wants you to, make, wants you to think you're alone, that you're the only one. And God says, you are not the only one. I love you individually, but you are not the only one. I am right here with you no matter where you go. No matter what you do. Again, that is awesome and inspiring. Like, yeah, I can do anything. It's also scary because when we're in places that we shouldn't be, and we think, Jesus is here with me. It's like, hey, how's it going, Jesus? He's like, good. How are you? Good. What you doing? <laughs> Not what I was about to do. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I'm stopping that right now. Thanks, Jesus. Right? Because we're never alone. He's always with us. Here's a good one. Some people, this is their favorite verse. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ, Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are God's masterpiece. It's just that simple. It's, you're his masterpiece. The value of you is you're priceless. You're a priceless piece of art that God has created, that there are no others. There are no duplicates. You are you. He broke the mold after he created you. So we are his masterpiece. We are wonderfully made. Of course, we're a masterpiece, right? Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us. We are wonderfully made. Here's one that we don't always exercise. We are bold. 2 Corinthians 3, 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Most Christians are not very bold. Most Christians are very like, eh, I don't, I'm afraid to tell you about Jesus. Why? What are they going to do? They might hate me. They hated Jesus. Sorry. You're not him, right? You're a son. Who cares what they think of you? Are you loved by God? Yes. Are you forgiven? Yes. So who cares? You're an ambassador. Don't let it stick to you. Right? We have been guaranteed victory. Yes! That is awesome. You have been given, this is Psalm 18, verse 35. You have been given, you have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand sustains me. You stoop down and make me great. Isn't that awesome? You have been guaranteed victory. Man, you know what? It is so much easier. Like, I record sporting events uh, if I can't watch them. And sometimes I find out the score before I watch them. And I got to tell you, like when I realize, like when I hear that, you know, uh, Chelsea Football Club, like won the game, won the match, and I have it recorded, I can just sit back and enjoy it. You know, I mean, there's no stress. You're like, you know, Diego Costa makes a bad pass. It's like, it doesn't matter. We win. Right? I mean, that's how I felt going into last week, you know, when Tom Brady was coming back. It's like... We win. But the game hasn't been played. <laughs> we win. We've been guaranteed victory with that. Right? So we've been guaranteed victory in life because of what Christ did for us. We have, we're holding a secure future. I know these are, there are a lot of these things, but we need to understand these things because this is who we are. We're holding a secure future. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's word. We're secured in the future. He knows the plans he has for us are plans to prosper us and not to harm us. So when bad things, when we're getting harmed, I'm like, God, why are you doing this? It's not. Last one, we're whole in Christ. 
Colossians 2.10 says, In Christ you've been brought to fullness. We are whole in Christ, and Jesus came so that our life would also be full and whole. Folks, that's who you are. That's who we are. That's the question that everybody strives to want to know in life. Who are we? Who am I? What is my purpose? Why am I here? This is who you are. Live in this identity and you don't have to worry about what other people think of you. You don't have to worry about all the other things that come against you. Because you are who you are. And sometimes we get lost. Sometimes we take on the wrong persona. Sometimes we're in the wrong place. But that doesn't change who you are. If you are always who Christ says you are, and you live that way, you have nothing to fear. You don't have to worry about worlds colliding because you will always be the same. And what a great trait if someone can say to you, about you, I know them from here and from here and from here and from here, and they're the same. Right? That's an amazing thing, to be the same. We love the Lord no matter what it is that we do. So stop trying to live in multiple personalities. Stop trying to juggle all of these different worlds. Just be who you are. It's a lot easier, I assure you. And make sure that you treat others the way that the Word says that they're to be treated and who they are. And you identify them as who they are, but that you identify you as who you are. So when you look in the mirror in the morning, you can say all of these things because they're true. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for all of the things that we just read of who we are, who our identity is. Lord Jesus, our identity is found in you. Our value is that you died for us. Lord, I'm so thankful for all of those things. And I just pray, Lord, for anybody here that's here this morning who doesn't understand that about themselves. They've been trying to live in all these identities. Lord, just let them know who they are. Let them take this word and let it find uh, fertile ground in their life to bring forth that fruit. So wherever they go, they'll be able to be who they are. You know, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, maybe you've been trying to, to be a good person or you've been trying to get right or get clean or do all of these things. I just want you to know that God loves you, that Jesus died for you. And he didn't do it because of anything you can do for him. He did it because of all that he can do for you because he loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And we complicate things, but it's this simple. If that is you this morning and you want to have that relationship with Christ, maybe God's been speaking to you and you want to come into that right relationship with Jesus, just say a prayer, something like this. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for washing me clean. Thank you for making me a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for making me a co-heir with you. Thank you for all of those truths that Mike just shared. This morning, I just want that. I accept that free gift of salvation. If you're saying that prayer for the first time, just raise your hand. I just want to be able to pray for you. If this is the first time you pray, just, just raise your hand. Father, if, I just pray for those who are here who have made that commitment, that they would just be who you called them to be. Nothing more, nothing less, because they are already your masterpiece. And Lord, I ask that we would just live the life of a masterpiece, that we'd live a life that you've called us to live, and then we can put away all of the passports, all of the personas, all of the different disguises, and we could just be who we are. I thank you and I praise you this morning, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.